It is good to see everyone. Happy New Year. I don't know about you, but I think, I know, I know 2020 is going to be a great year. It is going to change everything that you knew and thought. When God told Abraham to pick up and move, I can only imagine what Abraham went through. He's listening to, as it were, voices in his head. Sometimes that's the way God speaks to you. Amen. And so, Abraham had to pick up, leave his family behind, and go to a place he didn't know where he was going. Right. We hear that story, we shout. We dance, we praise, we celebrate Abraham being the, the father of faith until we get that knock at the door. Until God says it's time for you to pick up and move. It's your turn. See, it's easy to believe for everybody else. But it becomes more difficult to believe when it's you. See, we can celebrate everybody else going through the storm. But we have trouble going through the storm. Amen. We say we have faith, but you don't know until you get that the knock at your door. When God says it's time to pick up. It's time to move. Ask Brother Paul about that. Paul minding his business on his way to Damascus, going about doing his business until the Lord appeared to him in the sky and said, Paul, I, I got to change your direction. But to make sure you understand, I'm going to blind you for a little while. Maybe most of us could be like Zacchaeus when the angel showed up and said, now your wife Elizabeth, I know she's barren. She's never had a child, but she's going to have a child. And, and he said, well, how shall I know this? I'm going to tell you how you're going to know it. You're just going to be dumb. You, you can't speak. You can't hear it till this baby come, okay? Amen. See, we read these great stories in the Bible, and they're great and they're wonderful until it is us. Amen. Amen. Oh, I know I may not, I'm probably not going to get many amens today, but that's, but that's okay. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm not going to preach for the amen. I, I just got to preach the truth today. Amen. amen. I want to read you a little part of a news story that I have. The fastest growing church has no buildings, no central leadership, and is mostly led by women. So that breaks all of our models. I know in our church we teach where women can't preach, women can't lead. Women can't pastor. Women can't do anything but sit there and, and, and be our servants. That's not in my word. I know it may be in your rule book, but that's not in my word. Because, see, God chooses who he uses whether we like it or not. He doesn't get our position. He doesn't get our, excuse me, permission. He don't need it. He don't care. When he selected Deborah, I'm sure there was some men that God, God, why you, why you got this woman judging us? So the scriptures say she was a judge. But I know it doesn't fit in our theology, so we have to excuse it to make it fit in. Okay? But the scriptures say she was a judge. The scriptures say she sat in the office that Moses occupied. God will use whoever he wants Amen. to do whatever he wants. Yes. I'm so sick and tired of the excuses. The question is not whether you're a man or a woman. The question is, did God call you? That's right. Amen. He said the woman should not usurp authority. That means to take something that didn't belong to you. That's right. Okay? Yes. We got a lot of men usurping authorities too. We so busy trying to shut down the women, we need to shut down a lot of men. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Amen. It says that burqa-clad Iranian women in the shadows 
It's a movie called Sheep Among Wolves. For the last year, few years, researchers have credited the underground church in Iran. I, I did say Iran. Let me say that again. I did say Iran. As the fastest growing Christian church in the world. It has unique characteristics that defy comparisons, comparison with churches in America and Europe. Yeah. And in the opinion of some who know it well, the church in the West could learn by studying it. Mm. The fastest growing church in the world has taken root in one of the most unexpected and radicalized nations on earth, according to Sheep Among Wolves the outstanding two-hour documentary about the revival that has taken place inside Iran. Amen. The Iranian Awakening is a rapidly producing discipleship, the, let me say that word again, discipleship movement that owns no property or buildings, has no central leadership, and is predominantly led by women. The documentary was produced by Frontier Alliance International, which supports disciple-making teams targeting the unreached and unengaged. There is a mass, mass exodus leaving Islam for Christianity within Iran. Efforts by the Ayatollah to destroy Christianity have backfired, but have served to refine and purify the church. What persecution did was destroy the church that was that were not disciples and destroy the church that were about converts, the Iranian church leader noted. All these churches planted found out that converts run away from persecution, but disciples would die for the Lord in persecution. So that brings us to our sermon today. I want you to go with me to St. Matthew, the 27th chapter, the 50th through the 54th verse. Verse 50 says this, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Now when the centurions and they that were with him, watching Jesus, saw the earth quake, and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. Amen? Amen. Strap on your boots today. Amen. Lace up your sneakers. Amen. My title for today is, Jesus Destroyed the Old Testament Temple Pattern of Worship. Uh-oh. That's right. Let, let me say that one more time. Jesus destroyed the Old Testament temple pattern of worship. Oh, yeah. And just to make sure we really got it, I want, I want to just say it one more time. Jesus destroyed mm -hmm. the Old Testament temple pattern of worship. Right, amen. When he died on the cross. That's right. I had to, though the Holy Ghost gave me the introduction this morning, so I had to write it out. So I don't normally read my sermon, but I got to read through this portion. Amen? Amen? I came today to challenge everything that you were taught that you thought you knew and understood about the church. These revelations have come to me in the process of writing the book about Paul and Moses and the deep treasure of understanding that is contained there in this mystery. Today, through the Holy Scriptures, I hope to help you lay the foundation with the Holy Ghost 
in the scriptures so that you and, and can help you to see and understand what the New Testament church should be. In this sermon, I'm going to use two terms. One is the organized church. One is the New Testament church. So let me define these before I go too far. So the New Testament church is that pattern of the New Testament church that exists in the book of Acts that was birthed on the day of, that the foundation was set and established in the covenant when Jesus Christ died and shed his blood on the cross. Okay? It was birthed on the day of Pentecost when God blew his breath from heaven and it entered the New Testament believers that were gathered in the upper room and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. The pattern of, the, of this characteristics are imprinted across the pages of the book of, of Acts. In laws, is laws and commandments regarding how it is to be governed and how believers are to live in the New Testament church pattern are primarily detailed in the writings of Paul the Apostle. Mm -hmm. The organized church, let's talk about it. Yeah. The organized church is what happens to the New Testament church when man takes over and not the Holy Ghost. When man organizes, he begins to lay his own laws and commandments in place and he supersedes those that were established by Jesus Christ through Paul and through God when they established the New Testament church. The organized church is built around the rules and the laws and the principles that we conceive in our heart. It's primarily communicated through the philosophical doctrine of man. The organized church takes on its own form and is governed by its own rules. It is based on the knowledge of man and not on the knowledge of the Holy Scriptures. Most of the time I would say that what the organized church is doing is in direct conflict with the Holy Scriptures. So today I want to take you on a journey through the scriptures very briefly. Okay. It may rock your world. Right. Some of you may not be happy with me when this sermon is over. Okay. It may conflict and contradict everything that you know. But I would challenge you to look beyond my words of what I'm saying and that you too would do as I have done which is search the Holy Scriptures Amen. And seek the Holy Ghost yeah. and seek Jesus Christ and his knowledge Amen. to figure out what we're doing. Amen. 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 Many churches are dead. Yeah. Mm, yeah. The organized church. Mm. So I had to classify them because, see, the New Testament church is still alive. Amen. That, but, but the organized church, you go into many of them, and they're so governed by their own rules that they're dilapidated and falling down. Oh, they look pretty on the outside. Mm -hmm. Jesus called them white sepulchers. He was talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He said, you know, you look beautiful on the outside. You're all white and pretty. But on the inside, you're full of dead man's bones. Yeah. I told my beautiful wife that I won't lead an organized church again because I've been fighting with people for 35 years. I'm tired of fighting. I've been preaching to them and they have not changed. We're still living the same way. You come in the choir, they fussing and fighting. That's where the devil started. The fussing and fighting stays there. You come out here, we're fighting over pinch, benches and pews and seats. And we're fighting over what songs. Well, I don't like those songs. I like these songs. It don't matter what song you sing if your heart is not right. Amen? Amen. We sing for entertainment. And we sing, we, we attend for the convenience, okay? We feel good about coming to this building. And we sit here and we listen for a little while. And then we go back the door and we live like we don't know the Lord. Right. Amen. Amen. 
We're encouraging people to come to church, but when we come here, what do we do? We want them to listen to us sing, and we give them a great philosophical sermon. I'm so tired of people telling me that if I give, I will be blessed, okay? I've got news for you. Money is not the seed, okay? Amen. Jesus said that the word of God is the seed. I take Jesus' authority over anybody else's, okay? Because Jesus was God with us. The problem is we so busy telling people to sow a seed of money, nobody's sowing the seed of the word. Yes. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Yes. We're talking about how people are going to be blessed by all of these things, but it is the word of God. When you speak the word of God, that will get in somebody's heart and that will change them. Yes. Do you think Jesus is going to be happy when you get to heaven and say, you know, God, I told everybody about the seed, and I told them that if they sow this seed, they're going to be blessed. Uh -huh. Jesus said, it's not the money. I, I, I already own the cattle on the thousand hills. I'm looking for some righteousness. Yeah. What I don't own is your heart. Mm -hmm. Come on. God owns everything in this world but your heart. Wow. He owns your body. Mm -hmm. He owns your soul. He owns your spirit, but he did not take charge of your heart. Let me define kingdom work for you very briefly. So Paul writes, not Paul, Peter. I got it here, but you, you, you don't, most of you probably already know this, but I'm going to talk about it very briefly. In 2 Peter 3, 9 through 12, Amen. he said, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, mm -hmm. but that all should come to repentance. All right. See, one of the characteristics of the organized church, they no longer talk about repentance. Amen. If you don't talk about repentance, you're not a New Testament church. Because the only way you can get saved is to repent. When Jesus came preaching, he said, repent, Amen. for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Amen. When Amen. Peter, when John were preaching, and Peter, they said, Peter, what must we do to be saved? He said, repent and believe and receive Jesus, Amen. and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, okay? Amen. Until you repent, you are not saved. I don't care what they say. I don't care what they write in the rule book. Yeah. I don't care how many people declare that you are saved. Until you repent, Come you on. are lost. Yeah. Some of them say, well, what does repent mean? Isn't that something? Turn. Turn from what? Sin. Mm. To what? Righteousness. Mm. Walk with God. Yes. Okay, I got to deviate yes. just a little bit. That's good. Titus. Uh, put something in the Bible there, but we got to go to Titus very briefly. Right. We're going to come back to old Peter, but Titus chapter 2. I have to thank my beautiful bride for this one because most of the time when we're at home, the TV is off and she'll ask a question or I'll ask a question and we find ourselves talking about the scriptures. Now, if you don't know where Titus is, all of the T's are grouped together in your Bible. So if you don't know how to find this quickly, that means you haven't worked with your sword enough. Uh -oh. You know, you the, the, the word of God is a sword. That's what, that's what Paul wrote when he wrote about the sword of the spirit being the word of God, when he talked about the whole armor. Uh -huh. See, most of us got a weapon. We don't even know how to use it, okay? okay. We don't know anything about it. So the only weapon that you have as a true believer in God is the, is the word of God. Amen. Most of us don't know enough words to fight find our way out of a paper bag, okay? We got some dull stuff, okay? But the true word is sharper than any two-edged sword. Amen. It can divide asunder some stuff, amen? But see, a lot of us got that old dull word. We got that word that we don't, we don't even know anything. We got some word from some what some pastor preached. Uh -oh. oh, look out, pastor. Said. I want to know what Jesus said. We're so busy, we can tell you what the pastor said, but we can't tell you what's written in the scriptures. We got a problem here. Matter of fact, when our churches have become cheerleading sections for their own purposes. Oh, come to my church. No, they're supposed to be coming to Jesus, okay? Well, I need you to come to church. That's why we're not getting anybody saved. We want them to come to this building. And that ain't what God told them to bring us to, to bring people to. We were never instructed to bring people to church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Pastor. 
I'm going to church. That was never instructed. We've created some, some, some patterns that don't exist. And we wonder why people are not getting saved. He didn't say bring them to church. He said tell them about Jesus. Amen. Well, I'm going to get my neighbor to go to church. Why don't you just sit down and tell them a little bit about Jesus, okay? Save the time. Because <laughs> most of the time we get them in church, the first thing we start doing is begging for money. Then we wonder why. Well, why won't people go to church? Because you're not, you're not teaching them about the NT church, the New Testament church. You have invited them to the organized church. Because, see, the New Testament church lives in you. Amen. Amen. Okay, so let me finish this very briefly and get back on point. Mm -hmm. Okay. 2 and 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, yes. teaching us, mm -hmm. let me say that again, teaching us, yes. grace came to teach you. Amen. Grace did not come to give you a free pass. Yeah, come grace on. came to teach you. Yes. What is it trying to teach you? That denying ungodliness mm -hmm. and worldly lust, mm -hmm. we should live soberly, yes. righteously, yes and godly in this present world. Amen. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearance of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. See, we have mischaracterized grace. That's right. We're teaching that grace allows you to sin. But grace here, the scriptures is very clear. Amen. Grace came to teach you that you need to do some things. Yes. You need to deny yourself. So every time somebody tells me about grace, I just point them to the scripture. I say, I don't know what grace you got. You might have got the grace that somebody wrote about in the book. You know, we can tell you what all these, these writers have said in their book, but no one can tell you what the scriptures say. I'm giving you the scripture right now. Grace came to teach you something that you need to, un to deny some things in this world. Yes. Denying ungodliness and worldliness. Mark that scripture. So every time somebody talks to you, well, you know I got grace. So you know the grace of God. I'm living by the grace. Ask them, okay, are you living by the grace that's causing you to deny some ungodliness? Isn't that something? That's good. That's good. That's real good. It's amazing what you learned when you open up the book. Isn't that something? Oh, I just, I just upset about three quarters of the church world right there. Yeah, the church world. Hallelujah. You all right here? Bro. Okay. Let's go back to Peter. You all right here? Second Peter 3 and 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, uh -huh. in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hastening to the coming of the day of the Lord, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. So he tells you twice. That the heavens and the earth are going to melt with fervent heat. Mm -hmm. Then we get a witness from John who wrote the book of Revelation. Yeah. He said, I saw a new heaven yeah. and a new earth yeah. because the old heaven and the old earth had passed away. That's right. So my question is this. Are you going to believe your theological teachers or are you going to believe what the scriptures just said? Believe what the scriptures said. Okay. So then, now let's, let's find the kingdom. If everything that you see is going to be dissolved, there is only one thing that will escape this earth. That is your soul and my soul. Mm -hmm. Amen. Because they belong to God. Yes. They, they'll either rise to eternal, uh, 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 to eternal place in heaven with God, or to eternal damnation. Amen. So that means now the kingdom of God is that which applies strictly to the soul. Yes. The only kingdom work that I can do is 
the song, okay? I, I got I got an amplifying scripture to help that one out, okay? St. Luke 17, 20 and 21. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. So the kingdom of God is souls. Amen. In verse 19 and 10 of Luke, he said, For the Son of Man is come to seek and save that which is lost. Amen. What is lost? The souls that God created in the beginning that belong to him. Yeah. He wants them back. Yes. So Jesus said in Matthew 16, 24 through 28, we all know this one. If any man will come after me, let him do what? Deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life will lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Bill Gates' money cannot buy his soul. Bezos, who owns Amazon, considered now probably the richest man in the world, cannot buy his soul. That's right, man. But God said, you can gain this whole world, but it won't be important if you lose your soul. That's good. There are a lot of people selling out to money. Yeah, when, God, when, when Paul wrote that the love of money is the root of all evil. He was writing it in the book of Timothy. Timothy is the, is, the, is the pastoral epistles, and he was writing to the leaders of the organized church. That's who he was writing to. Oh, it's good for everybody else, but he was writing to those that were in charge. Go read that passage. He was writing to those who were leading the church. Matter of fact, there's one, so when he talks about the office of the bishop in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and the office of the deacon in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and the office of the elder, yes. in every one of them, as he describes them, he said, do not be guilty of filthy lucre. That's right. That's right. That's right. It's different on every, everything else is a little different, but the one common phrase is, do not do not seek after, lust after filthy lucre. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That word lucre is money. Yeah. So God is very concerned about the leaders of the organized church primarily seeking money. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was the stir of the water. I was just stirring there. Now let's get back to the subject. Let's go to St. Matthew 27, 50 again. See, when Jesus cried with a loud voice, he yielded up the ghost. Yes. And at that moment, the veil in the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. Amen. I used to think it was God who ripped the veil. As I, as I worked on this book, I came across a scripture that we need to go to now. Let's go to Hebrews 9th chapter, verse 11 through 16, and let's kind of put this in perspective. So Hebrews is all the way at the end of your Bible. Go all the way to the end. You get the Revelation back up. You got Peter, James, and John. Then you got the book of Hebrews. There are, there are people that say, well, Paul didn't write the book, and I agree with him. God wrote it. Amen. Paul was just the one that put the pen on the paper and, and, and wrote down. Anybody believe no, uh, Moses uh, wrote the book of Genesis? He, he may have put it down on the paper. 
But the information in the book of Genesis did not come from Moses. It came from God because he, Moses was not there in the beginning. It came from God. So when you read the book of Hebrews, it helps you out. It starts out with the word God. It is the only book in the Bible that starts with the word God. And then there it writes about Melchizedek. Well, nobody in this earth knew about Melchizedek until it's penned in the book of Hebrews. Well, there's something else penned in the book of Hebrews that we want to talk about now. So in the ninth chapter, it says in the 11th verse, but Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption. Beautiful scripture. But if you look before it, he's, there's something that set it up. So if you look back at verse number number six, so the one through five kind of gives you a description of the old tabernacle. But in verse six it says, now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle accomplishing the service of God. Amen. But into the second went, went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not made, not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience which stood only in meats and drinks and yeah. divers washing mm -hmm. and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. Okay. Now let's put this together. Let me paint the pattern. So now, in the Old Testament, Anybody could go into the the, the, the outer the, 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 the courtyard, mm -hmm. but into the holy place. That's where the priests went, mm -hmm. and they went. They ministered twenty four seven, yes. kept everything going. Yeah. But into the most holy place, mm -hmm. only the high priest could go once a year. Yeah. Yeah. But he could not go without blood. Right. He had to take some blood with him. Yeah. Now in his hem of his garments there was some bells sewn. Right. And as long as he was walking and they could hear the bells ring and they knew he was okay. Yeah. But if he didn't stop, if he stopped moving, they had a rope tied to him so they could drag him out. Right. Because could nobody go into the holy place right. because God's presence was in there. And if you touched that and you were not clean, you would die. Yes. To make sure we got the picture, there's a thing happened in the Old Testament. David decided, I'm going to go get the Ark of the Covenant and I'm going to bring it up to Jerusalem. He wasn't following the pattern. Right. They put it on an on a ox cart. We're going to brand new cart and we're going to get an oxen that's never carried anything. And he fixed that thing up. The problem was that wasn't the way God said do it. Right. As they're going up there, the cart hit a little bump and it looked like it was going to fall. Yeah. I don't think it was going to fall, but the man beside it reached out without thinking about it, touched it, and fell dead. Because yeah. yeah. huh. he said, this thing is holy. Yeah. Only certain people could touch that Ark of the Covenant. Yeah. He wasn't authorized. Right. David got an attitude. Yeah. They put the Ark down somewhere, and while they were down there, guess what? While the Ark of God was there, everything got blessed. Yeah. David said, you know what? We need to bring this blessing up to Jerusalem. Yeah. Let me get me some good priests, yeah. and let me make sure that they read up. Yeah. They had to go and sanctify themselves. Yeah. They had to get the word inside of them. Yeah. Then they went down there and they got the ark. They brought it up to Jerusalem. Yeah. That's the time David danced out of his clothes. Yeah. Okay? Amen. So God has let them know that I'm holy, and if you touch me without being holy, you just going to 
die. Wow. Okay? Yeah. So the priests go in one time. Yep. Jesus went to Jerusalem at Passover time. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. He's there at Passover time. They, they, they hung him on the cross. He died. Mm -hmm. In a place that says in Luke, they pierced him in the side and blood and water ran down. Yes. Now here in Hebrews, in the 11th verse, or the 12th verse, it says, well, verse 11 says, he became our great high priest. Mm -hmm. And he entered into the holy place yeah. by his own blood. His blood. That tearing of the veil that we saw was Jesus entering the temple with his own blood to put it on the altar to offer the blood sacrifice. Because he said he only did it once. One time. So the timing of it says if he's died on the cross, there his fresh blood is. Now let's take the blood of the sacrifice. He picks it up himself. He goes through the curtain, tearing it. He places it on the holy place. Yeah. And it's done. Yeah. So what that means is that, now let's get this picture. There are priests all over this temple. This is the high time. Okay, they're getting ready to do the sacrifice. But before they can do it, Christ beat them to it. <laughs> Okay, he ripped the veil. They got a problem. The veil ain't intact. Anybody can walk in now because the Spirit of God left. How do we know this? That the Spirit of God went out into the earth. When it hit the earth, it caused an earthquake. Do you remember when the apostles were praying the second time and the Holy Ghost was coming upon them and it said it shook the ground under their feet? Yeah. You remember when Paul and Silas was praying in, 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 in jail, what happened? The Holy Ghost shook the ground under the prison, just rocked it. What do you think caused this earthquake? When God's spirit left the temple, it started shaking the earth. Yeah. It was waking up everything. Yeah. But it only woke up the things that belonged to him. Yeah. The saints walked, woke up. Amen. So Jesus had already resurrected because the saints that got up could not be the first resurrection. Yeah. All right. <laughs> he just tarried in the grave for three days, okay? Yeah. He was down there doing some work. Yeah. He was preaching to the saints that were in prison. That's what it says. Yeah. He was preaching to those that had died looking for him, okay? Right. That's what, so you, you go study your scriptures. All of this is there, okay? Yeah. So, so, so now the priests are looking up and the veil is ripping. Yes. They can't go do the sacrifice now. They walk in there and they realize God ain't in there. The presence of God is no longer there. They got a problem. He ain't showed up again since then, okay? And to make sure that they, to help them get it 70 years later, God said, you know what, I'm tired of y'all giving me these useless sacrifices. We just gonna tear the whole temple down. Boom, gone. <laughs> Out of here, okay? <laughs> but see, we, 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 so the Old Testament and the New Testament were about temples. This is the piece we didn't get. This is the fresh stuff I want to share with you. See, Moses went up into the mountain, and God showed him the holy place in heaven. And he told him, now remember what you see and go down and build a tabernacle exactly after the pattern of what you saw in heaven. Okay? Then he wrote some laws. He wrote the book of Leviticus. He wrote the book of Deuteronomy. So Leviticus is the first giving of the law. Then the book of Numbers. Remember they wandered around the wilderness in disobedience. So those people that were more than 20 years old, they died. So now he's got some new folks. Now i got to disciple them. So he writes the book of Deuteronomy. Deuter meaning second, nomos meaning law. So Deuteronomy is the second giving of the law. And then at that point, once he finishes his job because of his disobedience, he can't go into the promised land, he's got to turn that over to Joshua. But you need to do a study on Joshua. See, when Moses would go into the tent and the presence of God would come down, everybody else was afraid. They'd go to their own tent, except Joshua. He'd go stand in the outer court. 
See, if you want to grow in God, you got to get close to God. Yes. And you got to get close to those who are close to God. Yes. yes. When Philip was on his way and he saw the eunuch, the eunuch said he was reading the scriptures in the Holy Ghost, so go join the caravan. In other words, go interrupt the vice presidential motorcade. Because he was a man of greater power and authority. Okay? He should have been killed walking up in there. You, you don't believe me? Go try to get next to any American president see how quickly you're on the ground. So he joined himself... To, to the carriage, and he was reading where the, it says, talked about someone being led there, a, a dumb as a, a, as a lamb to the slaughter. And, and, and the eunuch said, well, who is he talking about? Himself or some other man? Because he asked the question, how can I know except some man instruct me? Right. That's why God put five-fold ministry in the church. Go ahead. Not to, it's not a title, it's a function. That's right. It's not a position, it's a function. Right. It's not so you can dress up, it's a function. Amen. So we can answer, so like I'm here today, I'm answering questions that some of you may never have asked or you may not have clearly understood, and maybe you do. If you do, praise God. It was new to me. You know, when God hit me with this in the last month or two, it was like a brand new revelation for me. It's like, wow, I missed this the whole time. Okay? But let's get back. So the temple has been put out of business. Yeah. Right, yeah. But God showed them the pattern in the temple in the Old Testament. Yes. Then he gave them laws. Mm -hmm. if, you, if, you, if you were a woman and you were unclean, there was a certain time up here, you had to go wash yourself and you had to bring an offering to the, to, uh, to the temple, okay? Mm -hmm. if, if, if other things happened, there were always rules and laws governing how they were to participate in coming to the temple. Right. I got some news for you. The New Testament is about a temple too. Right. You are the temple. We have been doing so much wrong. We've been trying to usher in the spirit. God said, how can you usher the spirit in when I live in you? We've been meeting here to worship. Jesus already told us it's worship is not a place anymore. You remember when he met the woman in Samaria? See, Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom. To keep them from going to Jerusalem, they built a temple there. So they would worship in Samaria, and then the people in Jerusalem would worship in the temple in Jerusalem. So when Jesus said, I must needs go to Samaria, when he met the woman at the well, she asked him a question. Of all the questions she could ask, she said, where shall we worship? Mm -hmm. Jesus said, thank you, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> Neither here in Samaria nor in the mountain of Jerusalem because Jerusalem is sitting on a mountain. Every place in Israel leads up to Jerusalem. It's like the mountain peak. Yeah. Okay? He said because you, you don't know what you're worshiping. Amen. He said neither in this place or that place. He said God is a spirit. Him. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Yes, sir. So when we've been coming here to worship, we've been breaking every rule in the, in, in, the, in the scriptures. Because we are not coming to the temple like they did back then. We are the temple. In the Old Testament, they had a choir to sing. You are your own choir. He said, making melody in your heart unto the Lord. Let me do that again. The Old Testament pattern of the temple, they had a choir. And they ushered in the Shekinah glory. When Jesus breathed and God breathed on us on the day of Pentecost, he filled your temple with his spirit. And then he said, worship me. Where? Make melody in your heart to me. I'm not on the outside, I'm on the inside. Amen. Okay, let me get totally in trouble. See, in the Old Testament, they raised money to take care of the physical building. They would, they would go and everybody had to bring offerings to the temple. 
Okay? The priests had to eat off of the offerings brought to the temple. We've been struggling because we're trying to figure out why they didn't talk about tithes and offering in the New Testament. Because they don't have physical buildings in the New Testament church. But when they did take up money, they, they went and sold what they had, they raised it, and they bought it so that there would be no needs in the temple of the bodies of the believers. When Paul was going to Jerusalem, he took up money, not so that they could pay their dues to the organization. He said, but we got some poor saints in Jerusalem. They have some needs. You have been blessed by, by what God has bought through the Jews. Won't you send some money to them so that we can take care of their temple, their body? Well, like I said, I, I knew it was going to get rough. I knew it was going to get rough. I knew it was going to get rough. I knew it was going to get a little hot in the kitchen. But it's okay. Because we, we, we're doing something wrong. Stop and ask yourself a question. We have books in the Old Testament that shows how the children of Israel wandered. And it was written for our learning so we would not fall after the same examples that they did. Right. Okay? Why in all of the books is there one book written called the history of the church? It's called really the Acts of the, the book of the Acts of the Apostles. Okay? And God wanted to make sure that he got it right so he had a doctor to write it. And y'all know when a doctor starts writing, he's going to pick up every little detail. You don't believe me? Go to the doctor and find out something wrong. They're going to start writing all the blood pressure is this and the, the you know, every, every, every analysis. He's going to look at the whole chart of everything that's wrong with you and come up with a diagnosis. So, so Luke wrote the book of Luke, but he also wrote the book of Acts. He was a physician. So we have a detailed history of what the New Testament church looked like, the pattern. That's right. That's right. I now know why we don't have any power. Because the laws, the commandments, how we are supposed to operate in that structure was written by Paul. And so let me just prove it to you. Let me just, let, I'm just going to go through a list of what Paul tells you about. He tells you about the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22 through 23. The works of the flesh, Galatians 5, 19 through 21. He gives you love definition in 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter. He talks about the church organization purpose in Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, 1 Corinthians 12, 28 through 31. He talks about the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27, Romans 12, 4 through 5. He gives guidance for the elders in 1 Timothy 5. He explains the gifts and callings in 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 11, Romans 12, 6 through 8. He helps you to understand death in 1 Corinthians 15. He tells you about how to be caught up, which we have misnamed the rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 17. He explains the whole armor of God in Ephesians 6, 11 through 18. He gives you the office of a bishop in 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. He gives you the office of a deacon in 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 13. The office of an elder in 1 Peter, well, first, uh, what Peter wrote about the elder in 1 Peter 5, 1 through 5. We learn about the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 32. I'm about halfway through. We learn about marriage in Ephesians 5, 21 through 31. Family responsibility in Ephesians 6, 1 through 9. We get a definition of the gospel in Romans 1. We learn about faith in Hebrews 11. We learn about justification through faith in Romans 5. We learn the purpose of the law in Romans 7 and Galatians 3. We learn about salvation in Romans 12. We learn that the body is the temple of God in 1 Corinthians 6. We learn the mystery of God in 1 Timothy 3.16.
Then he reveals mysteries. He reveals the mystery of Israel's election in Romans 11.25. The mystery of the gospel in Romans 16, is 16 and 25. The mystery of God's wisdom regarding Christ's crucifixion in 1 Corinthians 6 through 8. The stewardship of, ministry, of mysteries in 1 Corinthians 4 and 1. The mystery of speaking in the spirit in 1 Corinthians 14 and 2. The mystery of death in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 54. Paul's knowledge in the mystery, Ephesians 3, 1 through 7. The mystery of fellowship, Ephesians 3, 8 through 12. The mystery of the marriage and the church in Ephesians 5, 31 through 33. The mystery of the gospel, Ephesians 6, 19 through 20. The mystery of the gospel, Colossians 1, 23 through 29. The mystery of God, of the Father, and of Christ, Colossians 2, 1 through 4. The mystery of iniquity in 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 through 12. And the mystery of godliness in 1 Timothy 3, 16. I would dare to say that most people know very little of that. And we wonder why we don't have any power. We're trying to operate as the New Testament church without the knowledge, without the laws given to us. But you know, the worst thing is this, is not so much what we're doing, but it's what we didn't do. We have went back and recreated the Old Testament church. We built buildings. We we put robes on. We got special oil. We got special everything. But see, all the apostles had was Jesus. We went back and we said, you know, if we dance the right way, if we sing the right way, if we get the right building, if we if if we if we make it just right, we're we're spending hours studying the Old Testament. So let me ask you a question: If the Old Testament didn't save them, why do you think it's going to save you? Why are we bypassing Christ? So we in the church are bypassing Christ, going back, oh, man, look at that priestly robe. I want a robe like that, okay? I, I need the gown like that, okay? You know, they mix the oil a certain way, so I want to mix the oil a certain way. You know, if I get this just right, God's going to bless me. But see, when Peter and John was walking up in that temple, they said, silver and gold have I none. I, I don't have a whole lot, but I'm going to give you what I got. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. We have put a lot of stuff in the place of Christ. I don't think he's very happy. We're inviting people to church instead of, let me tell you about Jesus. We're trying to get our neighbor to church. And maybe the reason we need to have the church to tell them about Jesus because we don't know that much. Amen. <laughs> maybe we don't know that much. Yeah. But the scripture said we need to know enough to give every man a reasonable hope regarding the salvation that's in us. That's right. Amen. That's right. Amen. If you can't tell someone to be how to be saved, how do you know that you're saved? Wow. Isn't that good? That's good. That's right. Oh, I came to press today. <laughs> I'm pressing hard. Because, see, I got a problem. When you stand before God, it's going to be too late to get it right. See the ten virgins. As I go to, as I close, I've been here too long already. I've been here too long already. I didn't intend to preach an hour. I'm just trying to get it all out. Uh, but, but see, those ten virgins are—they always bother me. They weren't. That was. They were not in the world. They weren't. They were not in the world. They, they were waiting on Christ. They had some oil. In their lamps. Okay? I have to thank Ramona for this because for, for about three years she's been wondering. She said, you know, I'm stuck on this parable of the ten virgins. 
So we've been talking about this parable for like four years. Because we were trying to figure out what the oil was. God, what did they run out of? What was the oil? What's the oil, Lord? Do I have enough oil? I never will forget the day the Holy Ghost slapped me upside the head. See, wrong question. It's not what the oil was, it's what does the oil represent. The oil represents being prepared. Notice what he said. The five were wise, five were foolish. The foolish took their, 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 their lamps but took no oil. The wise took their lamps but they took oil. They were prepared. They were ready. I said, well, God, how do I tie this together? So we're going to go to the last place and I'm going to be done. Turn with me for those that's got your scriptures to Ephesians, the fifth chapter. If nothing else that I say it reaches home, maybe this one will, will bring it home. <coughs> so in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to read verses 25 through 27, but before I get there, I want to sure first read 32. 32. It says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself and the wife see that she reverence her husband. For years, I used to focus on doing marriage seminars using this scripture as a basis for teaching about the marriage. But then one day it quickened in my spirit. Paul said, I'm not really talking to you about a marriage between a man and a woman. I'm really talking to you about Christ and the church. Right. Yeah. But at the end, he said, even though I'm doing that, you still need to love your wife, okay? Yes. 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 I gave you a disclaimer, but that don't excuse you for not loving your wife. Amen. Okay? So what is Christ's job? Verses 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, yes. that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Amen. Christ sacrificed his life, yes. gave his blood, yes. became the perfect sacrifice. Yes. For what reason? That he might cleanse you and I yes. with the washing of water by the word. Yes. That we might be prepared. Yes. That we might be prepared to be a glorious church yes. without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. Yes. Thank you, Holy Ghost. He didn't want me to go to my seat without sharing this. When Jesus appeared to John on the island of Patmos, John wrote chapters 4 through 22. But Jesus dictated chapters 2 and 3. He dictated those letters to the seven churches. I got, had to get corrected again. I used to say, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the church. I was incorrect. It's not church singular. It's churches plural. Yeah. So every church was supposed to read what was going on in every other church. When he wrote to the first church, he didn't say, hear what's going on in your church. He said, hear Hear what the Spirit is saying to all the churches. Amen. I believe that the Spirit was speaking to those churches as well as every church down through history. Okay? But he also did it for another reason. Just in case you think that you're going to get your own grace, you're going to live any kind of way that you want to, I am showing you that there is a judgment that is coming for those that are in the house of God. Yes. Peter writes it this way. Yeah. 
if we scarcely make it in, yeah. we're in to the righteous and ungodly make it in, okay? Man. So Peter said, we're going to barely make it in. You don't have to take my word. Go read it. This is what Peter wrote. Yeah. But I want particular note of this. When Jesus judged the churches, mm -hmm. he did not judge them according to the Old Testament law. Right. He did not judge them for the Sabbath day, for the feast celebration, right. for tithe and offering. Right. Okay, for for, uh, for 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 all of those ceremonial things. Because if you remember before, all of that, the eating meat. So some people believe if you eat meat, you're going to be lost. Some people believe if you wear makeup, you're going to be lost. If you got jewelry on, we got all kind of reasons to lose, folks. But see, none of that is scriptural. Right. Because all of that was given until the time of reformation. The reformation has come while we're still looking back. He judged them according to what he gave Paul to write. He judged them for forgetting their first love. He judged them for having false doctrine. Amen. News memo, he judged them for adultery and fornication. Amen. He, do, he judged them for being lukewarm. Hello, somebody. Yeah. He judged them for having a name that they lived, but they were dead. Yeah. And he said, except you repent, you're not going to make it in. Amen. Right. So now you have a choice. You can continue to live and exist in the organized church the way you have known it and designed it in your mind. Or you can do like I did and go back and explore the scriptures. See, what I shared with you today, I didn't preach for you. I was preaching for Kevin. Because what does it matter if I gain everything mm -hmm. and I lose my soul? Mm -hmm. That's true. What point did Paul say? I beat my body. I keep it under subjection. Mm -hmm. Lest after I have preached to others, I myself would be found a castaway. Right. But if you look up that word castaway, it's the same word that's used as reprobate in Romans 1. Mm -hmm. Meaning God has given us over to ourselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let us stand. Father, we just thank you today. Lord, I thank you for opening my mind and heart yes. that I might know you. I have shared that which you have placed in my heart. I have given it to those that their ears might hear. Not what Kevin was saying. What I say means nothing. I am nothing. But I've taken them on a walk through scriptures. And I pray that the scriptures that I've shared, that they can go back and relive and reread. Because what is important is not what I'm saying. But what the Spirit of God, what the Holy Ghost is speaking in these last days and times. Yes. You have given us marvelous things. Yes. And by the mighty name of Jesus, all things were finished. It was settled. And if I walk in him, I have fulfilled everything I need. Oh, yes. Let that be our mindset. Yes. Let that be our desire. Let that be our purpose. In Jesus' name.